Yep. Okay, great. Hopefully everybody else can hear me. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Rachel Winkle. I'm also known as Dot Green on Facebook in Winder, Georgia. Um, I am a master gardener with Athens Clark County Extension. I'm also a vegetable farmer in Barrow County, uh, Georgia, out uh, near Statham. So you're looking at a picture of the beginning of my vegetable gardening experience. I have a very unique farm of three acres inside of a subdivision. So yes, that is the neighbor's fence there. We're kind of on the corner of the property, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really neat thing. So um, I hope that some of you might have uh, come to the um, class I gave last month, um, right before the lockdown. In that class, I gave a lot of detail on the basics of vegetable gardening. And I'm going to just briefly cover the basics this time. Um, I'm hoping that some of you were at that last class. If you were not and you are just beginning your journey in this, we are going to be sending you an email with a ton of additional resources. And one of those is the slideshow, a PDF um, copy of the slideshow that I gave last month that really goes into depth on how to start, like what to do with your clay soil, you know, um, just the, the very basic. So rest assured there's that. This class, we're going to get into the more of the nitty gritty, which is something I've wanted to do for some time to just share some tricks on how do I, how do I get my tomatoes to last? You know, how am I still picking in October? So um, just a quick review of the basics here. Um, they involve sun, water, soil, fertility, and the last one, observation and problem solving. And that is what I always seem to just glimmer over in um, prior classes, but what we're going to focus on today. Um, so just real quick in, uh, you know, for sun, vegetables need direct sun and they need a certain number of hours of this per day. Um, generally, that's six to eight hours. Um, if you only have four hours of direct sun per day, you can try, um, but your plants just won't uh, produce as much fruit as um, they would if they were getting more sun. Um, there is, this is not something you can skimp on. Light is mandatory. Um, why is it mandatory? Well, the, the reason why sun is mandatory is because it's, it's what makes plants be able to feed themselves. Um, you know, we either go out to the grocery store and buy our food and ingest our calories that way, or we grow our food and we ingest the calories that, you know, create energy in our bodies to help us live. Um, I'm sorry if y'all can hear my cats, they're running around behind me. <laughs> um, but plants also need energy and they get their energy from the sun. Um, so they take light and they take carbon dioxide to make their calories. That's why we need full sun on our vegetable gardens. Um, just a, a quick um, visual, on the left of your screen, you see a tomato grown in full sun. Uh, the right of your screen, you see a tomato grown in part sun, possibly indoors. And that tomato on the right is not gonna do very well. And in fact, it looks like there's about seven of them in that container, so not a good, not a good setup there. Okay, water is absolutely necessary and i hate to break it to you but my experience in georgia for six years has been that the rains just don't seem to come at the right time in the summer um they will not come for three weeks and all of a sudden you get all the rain you you, you would ever want in one day so you generally need to supplement your watering um, of your vegetable garden usually that's about one to two times per week um, if it rains on Monday and it's, you know, a good soaking rain, you won't have to water, you know, that Monday. You'll be able to wait three or four days and check again. Um, but generally, it's one to two times a week, and it is always better to water hard and heavy and then to wait than to water every day just a little bit. Um, the only time you would want to water every day just a little bit is when you're trying to get seeds to germinate because in that, in that you know, um, when you're doing that, they need constant moisture. Um, but if you were to water normal size plants every day, you would drown them. Okay, soil. 
We want that um, ever so desired, well-drained, fertile soil. Um, as I said earlier, please check the slideshow from last month if you would like some ideas on how to get that soil here in Georgia. Um, the other thing you want to know when you're starting out vegetable gardening is your pH um, of your soil. So I would encourage you to get a soil test with BGA extension because I guarantee you when you bring a plant problem to them, the first thing Laura is going to ask you is, have you gotten a soil test? Okay, um, usually the soil is acidic in Athens. I mean, that's just the, the type of soil that we have. Um, so that is likely to be one of the results you'll see on your soil test. Generally, you go, you're going to need to use lime before you, um, like you'll till lime into your garden before you plant in order to um, raise the pH a little bit to make it a little bit less acidic. At this point, we do not have time to use regular lime. It's April 15th and we are going to be planting here in the next couple of weeks. You have to use fast acting lime at this point. The, the regular lime takes too long to break down. Um, Fertility and fertilizer, this is another mandatory thing. You have to give your plants supplementary food. Just trying to till up a batch of our Georgia clay, there's probably not going to be enough nutrients in that to get you a good crop of tomatoes. So you're either going to have to add organic material like what I've listed in the middle there or use some kind of synthetic fertilizer. Okay, now we get into the good stuff. So the real the real successes come when you observe your plants, you recognize the problems and you troubleshoot those problems. So I hate to break it to you, but our weather is really difficult for growing vegetables um, in the summer, I should say. Uh, all those summer crops that your friends up in the north have no problem with growing, like the tomatoes and the squash, we have, um, we have some challenges here. And I put that in bold about disease and insect trouble. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I didn't put that there to scare you. But I do want you to be aware, um, I think a lot of us go into this thinking we might just get lucky. And I really encourage you to just continue to watch your plants. If anything looks weird, stop, take a picture of it, go on the internet and either compare the picture to things you see on the internet or send it to Laura at the extension office and find out what is this weirdness, what's wrong, and she can help you fix it. Um, you generally can't fix stuff that's already damaged, but you can stop the problem from spreading to new growth. Okay, so really quickly, um, we have frost dates. Um, this is a really important buzzword in gardening. Uh, here in Athens, the average last frost is April 15th. Um, that's based on probabilities though, and any of you living in a frost pocket um, might very well get a frost tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, I, I live in a little bit of a bowl, so I know I'm actually pulling up the weather app right now. I've got stuff covered right now, and I'm planning to cover tomorrow night as well because it says 43 degrees. And I know at my house, that doesn't mean 43 degrees, that probably means about 37, 38. Um, so you always want to plan your summer crops um, for after the average last frost date. For, you want to plant them after April 15th. Um, usually the first frost comes around October 31st. And um, if you all attend the fall gardening class in the fall, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, we had a warm spell there about a week or two ago and a lot of people were out planting. Um, remember, soil temperature is more important than air temperature for summer crops. So even if it is 80 degrees today, I don't know what it was, but even if it's 80, the soil is not 80 degrees but your tomatoes want 80 degree soil. So in terms of certain summer crops, in fact, actually in terms of all summer crops, they're gonna do better when the soil's warm. So if you haven't done anything yet, you've done great. Okay, so the cautious approach, wait until April 15th. 
Um, just a quick uh, note on crop rotation, because if I didn't say it, I'd be kicking myself. Um, you always want to organize your planting by plant family and move those families around each year. Um, so a three to four year rotation is best. So if you do tomatoes in bed A on year one, you cannot do tomatoes in bed A again until year three or four. And this, are, this is a chart of the different families. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I'm hoping you can. Um, the three that really are most important or most relevant are the brassicas here, the cucurbits here, and the solanaceae. Because if you look at these three categories, they basically have everything we like to eat in them. <laughs> <laughs> the other ones, um, not, not, not as much. Okay, let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's talk about specific things that happen to our vegetables, specific needs of specific vegetables, and what better place to start but with tomatoes. Um, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can about tomatoes, but I could probably talk for three hours about tomatoes. So in the interest of other crops, I will, I will do my best <laughs> to, to not give all the time to the tomatoes. Um, you probably have heard the words determinate versus indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, the determinate tomatoes will produce their whole crop all at once. They, they set all their fruit basically at once. Now, that doesn't mean that it's like next week you're gonna harvest all your tomatoes. It's more like they, it comes in in about maybe like a four week period that the blooms develop, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that, and the fruit forms. Um, but you can't expect a determinate tomato that is planted on May 1st to produce on September 1st. It will die before that because it's gonna just produce one big crop and that's the end of it. The indeterminate tomatoes don't stop producing. However, my experience with indeterminate tomatoes in our climate is that they do stop producing um, when the weather gets really hot. And that could just be tomatoes in general having a difficult time when it gets really hot, that the, the blooms just can fall off, um, pollination is often unsuccessful when the temperatures are over a certain amount and also the nighttime temperatures. So you could either do indeterminates to, for the entire season or you could do two crops of determinates. Um, the other thing to say about determinate and indeterminate, you're gonna have much more work staking the indeterminate plants. Um, they grow all summer long, so they are really, really, really long. Um, you're going to have to deal with that. Um, the determinants are a little bit neater. Okay, I want to talk about hybrid versus heirlooms. And this is, I'm talking about in relation to tomatoes, but it's, you know, any um, vegetable or fruit. We have hybrid varieties and we have heirloom varieties. The hybrid varieties are produced by cross-pollinated plants. And the best like, metaphor I can give is that a, a hybrid is like a labradoodle. Um, somebody thought that it would be interesting if we crossed a Labrador with the poodle that we might make a better dog and they came up with a Labradoodle. And it's very similar with a uh, tomato, hybrid tomato. They see a plant that has good disease resistance, another one that has good flavor. They breed those two together and over time they're able to get a hybrid that has the good qualities of both mother plants. Um, usually hybrid variety, well hybrid varieties are bred for better yield, taste, appearance, and disease resistance. Um, you, you, can't, you can't, okay let me say this a certain way, while you can save the seed from a hybrid tomato, when you sow that seed you don't know what you're going to get. Um, you, you'll get a, a tomato, but you have no idea the flavor, the size, the disease resistance, anything. So generally people do not save seeds from hybrids. Now heirlooms are open pollinated, which means that they are, they've, they've been with us for generations. They self, can self pollinate or be pollinated by an heirloom of the same variety and they will come true. So 
an example of this is if on my farm I were if I were only to grow heirloom Cherokee purple, all of the seeds from those tomatoes would yield Cherokee to, uh, purple next year. But I couldn't do that if I only grew like Better Boy, which is a hybrid. So the heirloom is like a purebred dog, like a Labrador. Okay, um, how is this relevant to you? Um, well, it's relevant because we're in Georgia and it's really fun to grow vegetables here. And um, heirloom tomatoes are generally more difficult to grow than hybrids um, because they're bred for local adaptability. And a good example um, is the mortgage lifter heirloom tomato. I don't know if any of you have heard of, about this, but there's a story that uh, this guy, Radiator Charlie, he's called Radiator Charlie because he worked on, I, I believe it was cars or trucks or something. And he kept saving his tomato seeds, the good ones, you know, um, over the years. And he finally came up with this tomato seed that everybody bought. And it was so popular that he was able to pay off his mortgage with it. And it's called the Mortgage Lifter Tomato. And you can buy it today. Um, it was developed by Radiator Charlie in West Virginia back in the 20s and 30s. Um, I've grown the Mortgage Lifter. Um, it's a nice tomato. It is harder to grow than what follows on the screen, the Better Boy Hybrid Tomato. Um, this tomato will, well, first it has the Guinness record for amount of fruit produced from a single plant. So it's going to yield a lot more tomatoes than the mortgage lifter. Um, it's also resistant to certain diseases that you see there. Um, so that's the difference between hybrids and heirlooms. You know, it really does come down to a personal choice. If you do do heirlooms, you're going to have to be more diligent, um, particularly with disease, watching for disease and correcting diseases as they come. Um, I wanna show you a picture from um, Johnny's Seed Catalog. Um, this is a chart of resistance codes for tomatoes. And if you're gonna grow hybrids, um, which is what I grow on my farm, um, and what I know most farmers grow because they wanna grow something they know they can count on, um, you wanna look at these resistance codes. And I kind of put a dot where the two most important ones for our area would be, or at least this is my opinion of what would be the most important to look for, are early blight resistance and late blight resistance. Um, because these diseases definitely, I mean, I had early blight on one of my tomatoes last year. So, um, you know, not to say the others aren't important, but those are two that I would look for um, when I'm shopping tomato seeds. But that's what those um, initials stand for when you see that um, in seed catalogs. Okay, spacing for tomatoes, it's going to depend on whether you're growing a determinate or an indeterminate. Um, the determinants are spaced more closely, so one to two feet apart on average. The indeterminates are more like two to three feet apart. And the way I would decide how far apart to grow them is how basically rich your soil is. Um, if you've done a great job of amending and making it super fertile with a bunch of compost, then extend your, your spacing, make, do the two foot spacing for the determinants or the three foot spacing on the indeterminants. If your soil's a little bit less rich, then you could probably go with the shorter spacing. However, the shorter spacing is going to put you at higher risk for disease because there's less air circulation there. Um, one of the uh, things about tomatoes is they have some pretty high fertilizer needs, but they're really picky. Um, phosphorus is extremely important to tomatoes and phosphorus is the middle number when you look on a bottle of fertilizer it has three numbers so say like 10 10 10 and that is the NPK ratio which stands for nitrogen phosphorus and potassium so that middle number is P it stands for phosphorus and it's very important for tomato fruit to form on the tomato um, too much nitrogen on tomatoes can cause basically rampant vegetative growth. And when I say vegetative growth, I mean leaves. Um, all you have is leaves. You don't have actual fruit. That could be because you have a nutrient imbalance and the nitrogen is too high in your soil. 
Okay, um, going on to planting tomatoes. This is really um, kind of, it's, it is important and something I don't know if everybody knows. Tomatoes are kind of the weirdos of the vegetable world in, in terms of their planting. This is the, the, the one thing that we want you to plant deep. Uh, we want you to dig a, a good deep hole and stick that tomato transplant in so that just the top leaves are above ground. Um, and then you would want to cut off these lower leaves here and fill in the soil. And what is gonna happen is that tomato will root all the way up the stem. Um, it's a good idea to do this because it gives the tomato a better root system. And a better root system means a stronger plant, a more resilient plant, a better plant. Okay, I, I had to put in a slide about staking, even though we don't want to hear about staking because it's such a pain. But yes, please, please, please decide on your staking method before you plant your tomatoes and get the stakes in immediately. Um, the picture on the left um, is the Florida weave staking technique. And I will tell you, by the way, this is in my high tunnel right now. And the this is indoors though, please note this is indoors, not outdoors. That's why I have tomatoes of this size right now. Um, I did not stake these tomatoes immediately as I should have. And they all flopped over one day. We had really high winds. Um, so, I mean, they, they made it and I was able to stake them, but it gets infinitely more complicated the longer you wait. Um, on the right is another example of tomato staking. Um, in that one, they're actually tying the tomatoes or the, the branches to that, um, uh, what do you call it, wire thing. Um, on the left here, I'm weaving string in between the plants. That's called the Florida weave. Uh, let's see, you can also stake tomatoes with um, like cages, just the cages you can buy at a big box store. Um, those cages though, try to find the tallest ones they have. Um, and for indeterminate tomatoes, you definitely would need the tallest cage they have if you're going cages. Um, and even then you're probably gonna have them growing over the top of the cage. Um, Staking doesn't end on the day you put the stake in. Oh no, it continues all summer long. So about one to two times per week, you need to check the tomatoes and punish the misbehaviors in the batch because there's always going to be some branch that's trying to go its own way and you need to get it back in um, with the group. So um, the, the less you pay attention, the harder it gets. So um, do as I say and not as I do. All right, tomato harvesting. Um, this is something that I started to do a couple years ago because I found that it just increased the quality and appearance of my fruit. Um, and this, this has to do with when you harvest your tomatoes. And I'm talking the big slicer tomatoes right now. I'm not, I'm not talking cherry tomatoes. Um, cherry tomatoes, small tomatoes, you can wait for those to fully ripen on the mine before you pick. Um, however, the big tomatoes, from a farmer to gardeners, I would recommend picking the big tomatoes at what we call first blush, which is when you first start seeing color on the tomato. Um, the longer you wait, the more likely you will lose this tomato to insects. Um, you will have to you know, bring it inside, but there's no special treatment. You put it on the counter, it ripens itself, the taste is wonderful, and you have a tomato. Um, this, this really comes into play um, in midsummer when the, um, the uh, leaf-footed bugs come out and the stink bugs come out. Uh, we'll see pictures of what those guys do, your tomatoes, and boy, they will ruin them. So this is a way to grab your tomatoes before anybody else can. There's no need to keep it on the vine until it's bright red. Okay, insects. We're gonna talk insects first. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention hand removal, um, which is a possibility. I just want to give you the, the reality of trying to hand remove. So first of all, there are some insects that are too small or too numerous to squish. Um, if you have aphids all over your tomatoes, it, you're, it's going to take a long time to squish all those. And if you miss one, they, they, um, they, they reproduce so fast. 
Um, the other issue is that the caterpillars feed at night. So you would have to get up in the middle of the night with your flashlight to find them. Um, and then finally, the, there's some that are just so hard to catch, it's really hard to hand remove them. Um, so this leads us to sprays. And as a farmer, I do use sprays. However, I do use only organic sprays, like insecticidal sprays. Um, that is not to say that an organic spray is safe for the, the insects that we love, you know, like the honeybees, the beneficial insects and all that. Um, those insects can be hurt by organic sprays, by neem oil, by spinosad, by, uh, well, yeah, neem oil and spinosad are the two I use most frequently. So what you wanna do is if you do have to end up using a spray, just spray it at dusk. The bees have gone to their homes, they've gone to sleep, and it's safe to spray. Um, there's, you're safe as long as you do it at dusk. Um, I would not do it in the morning, although some people do suggest doing it in the early morning, only because I see, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, I, I see um, bees coming out very early, so I always spray at night. Okay, this is what you're going to see. Um, on the right side of your screen, you see the um, damage from a tomato fruit worm. Um, and on the left is the fruit worm itself. The tomato horn worm, you generally will just see a lack of plant. Um, if the to to tomato horn worm does that to your plant, what's on the screen, you're gonna need to buy a new tomato plant. Um, I don't think that's gonna come back. I mean, it might, you never know, but I, I would go ahead and start a new one. So what do you do about these pests? Um, generally, you want to wait until you actually were to see damage. And once you see damage, it's easy. You either get yourself BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis or spinosad. These are both organic treatments. Um, what I do is rotate between BT and spinosad. One week I spray BT, the next week I spray spinosad. BT is only toxic to caterpillars. They have to eat it. So you spray the leaves. You're still going to see the buggers the next day. It takes a couple days for them to actually ingest it and pass away. But it does work. Spinosad helps with more than just the hornworms and the fruit worms. And that's why I like to alternate. Spinosa will get those aphids. It will get those white flies, um, thrips. Well, yes, it will get thrips. So it will get some other insects you'll see on the tomatoes. Um, speaking of aphids, we have there on the top right of the screen, um, live aphids and then molted aphids. Um, on the bottom right, we have white flies. Um, I already mentioned that these are insects that reproduce very quickly. But the bigger problem is that they are vectors of disease. So it's not necessarily the, the, that, that they're sucking the juice out of your plant. I mean, they're so little. It's that they often transmit diseases that will end up killing your tomato plant or your pepper plant or your squash plant, et cetera. So if you see an infestation of aphids, it's a good idea to take care of it. And in terms of these small insects with the soft bodies, spinosad, neem oil, and insecticidal soap uh, will kill them. And I do have to put this in at the end. I would never, ever suggest using dish soap on your plants, period, because dish soap is not tested for safety on plants. It's tested for safety on your hands and on your dishes. So. I don't want to use a product that I'm not sure is going to do more harm than it's going to do good. Okay, the really bad guys for tomatoes, in my opinion, are the leaf-footed bugs and the stink bugs. And these guys get faster and nastier the, the longer the season goes on. The guys on the left, the leaf-footed bugs, they will, um, you might, might already had the experience of them flying right at you um, when you go over to, to visit your tomatoes. Um, they're very aggressive. Um, they all stink when you try to smush them. So um, some things you might see, the leaf-footed bug eggs are really unique. It's the only one that I know of in the garden that lays its eggs in that 
then that's just, just a straight line of eggs. If you see a straight line of eggs, very likely it's a leaf-footed bug egg. Um, that it's, I'm sorry the image is blurry, but on top of the eggs is a leaf bug nymph. Um, and I say nymph because insects go through life stages just like humans. So nymph is like their adolescent stage and most insects look really different in their adolescent stage and then their adult stage, I guess, just like humans. So the nymph um, is soft bodied, whereas the adult is hard bodied. Uh, the damage done by leaf-footed bugs and stink bugs is very similar, and it's these speckle marks on the tomato, and unfortunately, it really hurts the taste. It just, it, 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 it hurts the taste, it makes it more um, open to fungal infection, and it's just not anything you want to have. So, what do you do? It's difficult. I will tell you, um, controlling these insects is very difficult. In my opinion, they are the biggest challenge to gardening here um, in Athens. Um, and even, basically, any control is very difficult because of the way these insects behave. And organic controls work, but there's one method that works much better than all the others that I really want to emphasize, and that is trap cropping, um, because this has worked for me, and it's the only thing that has worked for me. Um, the idea of trap cropping is growing a crop solely to attract bugs away from the crop you really want to have. So you're literally trapping them on something that you don't care if they destroy that, you just want them to keep your tomatoes safe. It's like a diversion. Um, so when you trap crop, you do, you do have to deal with the trappings. Like you have to go to that crop and either vacuum up the, the um, bugs or you could spray them. Um, now the good thing with the sunflowers is the leaf-footed bugs are attracted to the sunflowers um, in the, still in the stage when the sunflower is dying. So if you wanted to use a spray on them, there's I've seen them with just completely covered in, in uh, leaf-footed bugs and no bees around. Um, if you do use a spray, there's not a lot of sprays that work on the adults. The only one that I can find is a pyrethroid based insecticide like permethrin. And I don't use permethrin, I'm just a little bit too scared to use it. I have just a handheld vacuum cleaner to try to <laughs> get them up. Okay, disease, guys, there's more. Um, tomato diseases are extremely prevalent in Athens and this has to do um, a lot with the high nighttime temperatures um, that we get high humidity and rainfall. Um, so I'm going to just give you some uh, quick cultural control methods. You want to use disease-free transplants or seeds. So, you know, it's cool when you share seeds with people, but collecting seeds from your tomatoes here in Georgia, well, you know, if you collected seed from a tomato that had late blight, there's late blight in the seed. So, you know, that's why purchasing new seeds, you know, is, is, uh, is a safer option. Um, also, cult another cultural control option is rotating out of tomatoes. Also, you don't want to work in the garden when it's wet from rain or dew. Uh, you don't want to use overhead sprinklers. And when you have diseased foliage or diseased fruits, get them out. Um, now, especially the fruits, because that's pretty easy to, to attack. Um, sometimes I will let the leaves go on my tomatoes just because I have so many, um, but keep in mind I preventatively spray a fungicide. So getting into what um, might come. Um, well, there's a lot of options. We have early blight, we have septoria leaf spot, we have late blight. Um, there's lots of different fungal and bacterial diseases, bacterial spec. So what I want you to do is watch the leaves of your tomatoes. If they are not solid green, if there's any kind of speck or spot on them, then there's probably an issue. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean like one leaf out of 500 has a speck, you know, I mean, it's, you know, you, you can tell when a leaf looks healthy and when it looks like something might be wrong. You might not know if something definitely is wrong, but if you think it might be wrong, take a picture, 
send it to UGA extension, they get a diagnosis. Um, usually a very simple treatment is either dacanol, which is chlorothalonil fungicide or copper fungicide. Uh, which one of these two you use depends on the disease you have. That's why you need to get a diagnosis. Um, I got bacterial spec on some of my tomato transplants, so I treated them with copper fungicide. Um, I did that because dacanil doesn't touch bacterial diseases, but copper fungicide does. So use your extension office. They're there for a reason. Um, last thing about tomatoes, blossom and rot. Um, now this occurs when calcium levels in fruit are low. It can be caused by lo low soil calcium, but what I've seen more often is that it's caused by a weird watering event. So let's say we get two inches of rain in one day and then we have a drought for two weeks. Um, or you didn't you forgot to turn your irrigation on, your tomatoes got really dry and then you over irrigated. So it tends to happen when there's drought stress followed by a ton of water. That just, it, it, it just messes up the calcium transport in the tomato. Um, so you really want to be regular with the watering of the tomatoes. And if mother nature comes in and does her rain, you know, get that into, you know, make sure you account for that in your watering. Um, another way to um, prevent or fix blossom and rot, rot is to avoid fertilizing with a high um, ammoniacal nitrogen. And then finally, I will tell you that this is my opinion. I'm, I'm not sure um, what Laura would say. Maybe she'll pipe in, but I personally believe that foliar sprays are a waste of money because the calcium does not move fast enough from leaf to fruit. I mean, once there is blossom and rot in the fruit, you can't fix that fruit. Um, so it's best to fix the soil, the issues in the soil that are causing the problems. Okay, let's get on to squash. So we have okay, some this comment. I mean, you, you mentioned, I, I mean, I think if you're already seeing, it depends on what kind of fruiting you're having, where you're seeing, I, I, don't know the research on that. I could check into it. Certainly, it's not going to save the ones that are already showing symptoms. Mm -hmm. The foliar would be kind of a preventative for future plantings. I mean, not future plantings, for future fruitings if you have enough time left. And it's just going to be dependent on how much time you have and, and how early you're seeing those symptoms and if you could potentially help out, you know, future tomato fruits. Gotcha. So there's a typical gardening answer. It depends. <laughs> okay. So the squashes, the squash family is large. I'm talking here, summer squash, winter squash, zucchini. Um, I guess pumpkins would fall more under melon. So let's just say squash. Um, you either have a bushy plant or you have a vining plant. A lot of the summer squash and zucchini are bushy and then slowly spreading. Um, there's a note on space there below. You can read that. Uh, UGA talks a lot about mounds. Um, I don't know how to translate mounds into my vegetable bed. So what I do is uh, squash and zucchini are about two feet apart and winter squash is about three feet apart. Um, so all squash has two different kinds of blooms on it, zucchini, uh, summer squash and winter squash. You have the male flower on the left and the female flower on the right. And the male flower, you need a bee or some insect to take the pollen that's in the male flower and put it inside the female flower for that female flower to mature into a zucchini, as you see in that picture. Um, so one thing um, that I will mention is important to know at this time of year is that the male flowers come first. So you plant your um, squash and you're seeing flowers, but you're not seeing fruit. Just wait a little bit. It's, it's likely that you, you just haven't gotten the female flowers to come. Now, if you're seeing both male and female flowers, but the female flowers are consistently not producing um, a, a squash or zucchini, what could be the problem is you don't have enough pollinators in your garden to move that pollen. So you can do it yourself by hand pollinating with a small paintbrush or a Q-tip, literally moving the pollen from the male to the female flower. Okay, the ugly side of squash. 
I know everybody's so excited about this. Okay, we have squash bugs, we have squash vine borer, and we have pickle worms. So let's talk about each. Oh wait, more. Downy mildew and powdery mildew. Those are the two diseases I see most often on squash. Okay, these are some of my solutions. I never direct seed squash. I always sow squash in little containers to transplant out into the field. Um, doing it that way, you can protect them. You can watch them more closely. You can keep the bad guys away from them. Another solution is to just overplant. Um, and I got this from Bob Westerfield, who's in a lot of, I think he, I don't know if he's still a UGA extension agent, um, but at least he was, and he did a lot of stuff on um, outreach, community outreach. And it was his suggestion, just, just plant way more than you think you need. <laughs> um, two foot spacing to help against, uh, prevent the, um, the different uh, powdery mildew and downy mildew. Um, one thing you can do to make your plants less tasty to the squash bugs and to prevent uh, fungal problems is neem oil. Um, neem oil will kill the squash bug nymphs and it makes it less tasty to the adults. It won't keep them away forever, um, but it helps and it does help against that powdery mildew. Um, let's see, Dacanil would help with the downy mildew. So the downy mildew was those yellow spots. The powdery mildew is like a white, whiteness. Okay, one thing you can also do is just give up in the middle of the summer. <laughs> and I mean, sometimes you know, you got to know when to fold them. And uh, a lot of people will grow squash in late spring, early summer, then th throw out their plants if there's anything left try again in August. And generally, the if you can go to a different location in the garden, you can get away with a late season crop. Um, and then as I said, always throw the diseased insect infested plants in the trash. Do not put them in the compost pile. Those insects are going to just come right back to your garden. Um, one thing I'm trying this year is I'm trying trap cropping with squash. Um, I had already explained trap cropping earlier, um, so let's just go right into the nuts and bolts for squash. Millet is a supposedly a good trap crop for squash. Again, I haven't um, tested it yet myself, but I'm doing it this year and I have a lot of hope for it. Uh, millet, I guess if you have livestock, you might want to use just normal millet. Um, to be able to use the millet for your, I don't know, chickens. Um, pictured here is an ornamental millet because I like my pretty and my flowers. So I bought um, seeds of Purple Majesty ornament, ornamental millet and I started them a couple weeks before I started my squash. And actually they're the only, th only thing that is planted in my fields right now that is like a summer crop. I don't have any tomatoes or peppers or anything out. I don't have the squash out yet, but I have this out and I have it covered tonight um, because I want it to get, I want it to be bigger than the squash when I put the squash out. Okay, and I think those other points were already covered earlier. Um, some more stuff about squash. Um, you go outside and you notice that one of your three squash plants looks like the picture in the bottom left hand corner. All the leaves are wilted. Do not go running to the hose. Um, when you see wilting on crops, particularly if it's only one and not all of them, don't run to the hose immediately. Um, in this case, like when one out of three um, plants is wilted for squash, this can mean the presence of the squash vine borer. And all you need to do to confirm its presence is go look at the stem of your squash. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture that just had a little bit of damage. This one on the bottom right, there's pretty decent damage there on the uh, stem. You can see it's been basically bored open. Uh, so one way you can try to fix this is get that BT, that Bacillus thuringiensis, um, that is the um, organic caterpillar killer and literally um, put it in a syringe, mix it up with water, put it in a syringe and inject it into the stem of the squash. Um, after you inject the stem, you might, if you can, try to mound dirt over the whole area um, to try to get it rooting better. Or if this is a long vine, if there's another section you can throw dirt over, like a new arm or branch, 
um, do that and it'll root in that location, give it more hope for survival. Another problem with squash that um, for me comes a little bit later than the squash bugs are the pickle worms. So um, these, you don't actually see the pickle worm. I hope you don't see the pickle worm. You see like somebody uh, shot your uh, squash with the BB gun. <laughs> So you'll see holes in the flowers, you'll see holes in the fruit. Um, and inside those holes is a little worm and it's eating the inside of the fruit. So with squash, I generally, when I start seeing this damage, I start alternating with the BT and the spinosad. Um, and the important part is just spraying like the area where the flowers are. Um, and again, you're going to want to spray at dusk. Um, but this one, wait until you see damage. I mean, you know, you don't need to be spraying like crazy with any of this stuff. You know, wait and, and when you see damage, then go ahead and correct it. Okay, getting on to a new crop, peppers. So peppers, about one to two foot spacing. Um, I would say um, look at your soil fertility and if it's highly fertile go two feet less fertile you can do one foot um it does have high fertility needs but like tomatoes we don't want to use too much nitrogen uh, peppers are unique in the um, summer crops uh, for georgia in that they actually do benefit from a little afternoon shade uh it might be hard to accommodate the peppers if everything else is in full sun uh, what i do is actually put shade cloth over my peppers it's very light shade cloth it only blocks like 10 or 20 percent of the sun um, but i found that it it does help them quite a bit um, because my my grow area is like 10 11 hours full sun a day i mean the whole day it's full sun there's no trees around um, one note um, here, the second to last bullet is you don't need to worry about planting hot peppers next to sweet peppers. You're still going to get what you want on each plant. Um, the only issue with doing something like that is if you wanted to save your seeds for the next year, um, you're going to risk the hot peppers and the sweet bell peppers cross-pollinating and then not being able to know what you're getting. Another thing with peppers is they tend to slow down mid-season just like the tomatoes. Um, the flowers may fall off when the temperatures get too high. Okay, on the left there is um, the reason why you might want to try for some late um, sh or some shade in the late afternoon. That's sun scald right there. And it's, you know, it's, it's literally sunburn. It's the plant equivalent of sunburn. And that fruit is never gonna get better. I mean, you can still eat the other side of it, but you know, it doesn't look too pretty. It's not going to turn red. Um, by the way, if anybody was wondering, green peppers are like an immature bell pepper. So this green pepper on the left with sun scald will turn into either a red, orange, yellow, or purple sweet bell pepper. On the right, we have uh, blossom end rot. So you want to, Blossom end rot, I'm identifying here as blossom end rot because it's on the bottom of the fruit, the blossom side of the fruit, the bottom. Um, there's a similar disease, or there's a disease that looks similar, but that's in a different location on the fruit. And that is anthracnose on the right. Um, so with anthracnose, you seeing the spots are everywhere on the fruit. They can be everywhere, whereas with blossom end rot, they're only on the bottom. Um, on the left of your screen, you see symptoms of bacterial leaf spot. Um, this is easily treated with copper fungicide um, or um, if it doesn't rain. <laughs> I say that because in 2016, we had quite a drought here. It was my, my first drought in Georgia. I know you had worse than that, but I had a bad bacterial leaf spot problem on my peppers, but I was safe by the fact it didn't rain for three months, so it worked out well. Okay, uh, other pepper problems, uh, cutworms, armyworms, corn borer worms can get into the pepper fruit. So if you see that hole, remember that looks like the pickle worm hole, um, maybe a little bit like a fruit worm hole. Again, you're going to want to do your BT or spinosad um, until those populations decrease. 
Okay, moving on to cucumbers. So we have vining varieties and we have bush varieties, but there's a lot more vining varieties than there are bush varieties. And uh, I've found that some bush varieties are not quite as bushy as they advertised. Uh, you're going to you're going to want to stake or trellis the cucumbers. Um, you can just grow them on the ground, um, but they will very likely peter out and die earlier than if you had gotten them off the ground and staked them. Um, so here you can see in the picture that white plastic, if you don't um, want to spend an afternoon making your own string netting, um, you can actually buy netting that's already you know, done um, to grow the uh, cucumbers up on. You have to train them into that netting. They, they don't listen and they just go wherever they want. So you gotta bring them um, back home. And uh, let's see what else. Um, I would suggest with cucumbers planting as soon as possible. Um, this year, I'm really going to focus on cucumbers inside my high tunnel um, because outdoors, the disease and the cucumber beetles is intense. So you like cucumbers, get them in now, get going now um, so that you can enjoy them. Uh, regular water is critical for cucumbers. Um, they, they, the fruits will not set appropriately if the water is not regular. Um, oftentimes you'll have pollination issues too where the fruit is all weird shaped and stuff. So that's often that it didn't get completely pollinated. Okay, um, specific problems, well, cucumber beetles. Uh, I have um, more issues with cucumber beetles on melons, but they are um, a big problem uh, with cucumbers as well. These, this is a tough insect because it's got a hard body. It's very fast moving. Um, it's, it's very hard to catch these guys. Um, so they're difficult. Uh, one option is you could use a row cover, a, they call it floating um, row cover, like an insect cover, insect barrier. Um, the only problem with that is once your cucumber starts flowering, you would have to take that off or the bees can't get in to pollinate. So, and then you can't get in to harvest. So an issue. Um, I'm going to emphasize plant early and just um, enjoy your cucumbers while you have them. There is very difficult in August. Um, they do get uh, the fungal diseases and bacterial diseases that you can submit a picture of to UGA Extension to maybe give you some better recommendations. Um, one last thing about um, cucumbers I want to mention is the bitterness. Um, bitterness is often associated with the variety that you grow. So when I choose my cucumbers and I'm looking through my seed catalog, I'm looking for the varieties that say no bitterness, no bitterness at all, does not get bitter even if left on vine, stuff like that. Okay, do you like amaranthus? Well, if you do, it turns out cucumber beetles love amaranthus. Um, so if you want to try this trap cropping, you can use beautiful amaranthus. On the right is called, the common name is Love Lies Bleeding. And on the left, I believe that's called Red Spike Amaranthus. And the red spike on the left is actually great in floral arrangement. So if you want to do a little combo planting this year and have some nice flowers in addition, it will help your cucumbers and it will help if you choose to grow melons. Okay, uh, moving on to green beans. Uh, green beans are kind of a shoulder crop, um, at least the bush beans. They do better in the beginning of the season and the end of the season. They do tend to suffer a little in the heat of summer, but I guess at this point, what doesn't except for watermelon? Um, <laughs> so the pole beans, I think, do better than the bush beans in the heat of summer. Um, that's my personal experience. Uh, green beans, you always want to direct seed them. You don't want to transplant green beans. So if for some reason you see them for sale in a big box store, do not buy them. Just buy the seed pack and sow your, sow your uh, green beans. You could sow them like every three inches if you want and then thin out to six inches apart or you could just save seed and sow every six inches. Um, you don't need very good soil for green beans. They, the, any, any plant would love a little organic matter tilled into our Georgia clay, but 
if you have, you know, so much compost, use the majority on like your tomatoes and peppers and less on your green beans. Okay, good air circulation helps prevent disease. I gave a list of possible things that might come up. Again, I urge you to watch the plants, watch the leaves. If the leaf is not green, fully green, take a picture, send it to extension. And there's also stringless varieties of green beans, which makes dinner preparation much faster. Okay, sweet potatoes. If you like sweet potatoes, get yourself some sweet potatoes right now and get some slip started because this vegetable is so easy to grow in Georgia. This is the only one I don't have to tell you about really any diseases or insects. Um, it's amazing. So <laughs> sweet potatoes are not grown from seed. They're grown from slips. Um, if you're scared about doing any of this process on the screen, you can just order slips online. Um, but if you want to do it, you know, the more homemade way, you just buy um, at a big box store. They'll have little boxes of baby sweet potatoes. I would suggest doing it that way and not getting it from the grocery store because what it's, what's at the grocery store might have been treated so it doesn't sprout. Um, so you get these little baby sweet potatoes sold in boxes and you suspend it over a glass of water. Um, you can just stick like three uh, toothpicks in it to, to suspend it above the water. Um, after a little bit of time, you'll start getting growth coming out. You'll literally have green shoots coming out. It'll start to bind. And what you'll wanna do when it's about six inches long is just break it off the potato, break the shoot off the potato, and put it in a glass of water where it will form roots um, on the actual sprout. And once you have roots that are about a couple inches long, you can either plant into your garden or plant into little pots. Um, whether you plant out or plant in pots is gonna depend on the weather. Um, if it's, you know, you wouldn't want to do that on a, um, you wouldn't want to do that on a really sunny day. Um, because, you know, they wouldn't be, they'd been in your kitchen, you know, for two months, they wouldn't be adapted to going out. But if you had, you know, cloudy day, the next day, you could go ahead and, and transplant them right outside or rain the next day, even better. Um, so it's very easy to do it, do DIY sweet potatoes. You get a great crop. And they're really, there's very few problems. The, the one, um, well, besides deer, of course, but deer can affect anything here. Uh, the only issue I've had with sweet potatoes is mice. Your word and word. I would say that that's partly my problem, not watching them close enough because, um, it, you know, if you don't watch your sweet potatoes, they can sometimes grow to gigantic sizes. So just uh, keep, keep an eye on them. Great, easy, trouble-free crop, and you will have food in your pantry all winter long. They keep for longer than um, other types of potatoes. Okay, melons and watermelons. These are just my favorite crops to grow. I just it's just so neat to be able to go outside, pick a cantaloupe, and eat as much as you want, like, every day. <laughs> so I'm really into growing cantaloupe um, and watermelons. I've done other specialty melons, too. Um, with, um, with these plants, you could buy transplants, I believe, um, at uh, the store, or you could sow your own seeds um, and transplant them out. Um, you, you really could direct seed or transplant. I'm just more of a transplant leaning kind of gal because I like to watch over all my babies and then once they're big enough, put them out. Um, but the only thing is if you want to try to grow a seedless watermelon, you cannot direct seed seedless watermelons. Very high likelihood of failure um, because seedless watermelons have very, very specific germination instructions. And I'm literally pulling my hair out right now over these uh, because they want 85 degree soil at the moment you plant and put the seed at a 45 degree angle and make sure that, you know, it's, it's just very specific for the seedless watermelon, but you can do it. Um, if you order seedless watermelon seeds, they're gonna come with a pollen, seeds for a pollinator vine um, because the seedless can't, pollinate themselves, they don't have enough pollen. Um, melons and watermelons need a lot of space. 
Um, there's a, let me, I'm going to bring up this point I'm thinking of when the picture comes up later on um, about space. Uh, you also need to irrigate regularly for optimal performance and expect about one to three, one to three fruits on average per vine. Okay, so cantaloupe, oh, so, okay, look at the picture here, and this is what I want to talk about, melons needing a lot of space. Um, I know I've been there, even though I'm a farmer and have a lot of land to grow, I've been there where you only have a certain amount of space to grow stuff. Um, maybe you only prepared a certain area or you have a raised bed or whatever, but keep in mind that the melon vine, all of that green growth does not have to be over your raised bed. It can be, you can lay down like a landscape fabric and let it just roll on the landscape fabric. So what I do is the bed in this picture is like, I don't know, eight feet behind me. And I've just put down landscape fabric so the vine can, you know, grow in a neat environment. There's no problems of having to mow grass right by it. And the bonus here is if you leave that black plastic down um, during the heat of summer, you take it off in fall and you've got a brand new spot to plant um, because you've just uh, smothered all of the bad um, Bermuda grass and seeds underneath it. Okay, uh, sun jewel Korean melon is what's pictured in that basket. Um, Korean melons are, have a slightly different taste than other melons. However, they do have a lot more fruits per vine. So if that's something you're into, you might want to look that up in the seed catalog. Um, when you harvest melons, uh, cantaloupe and specialty melons um, is, is dependent on the variety. And Generally, the variety I grow is a Disto 47, and I cannot say enough good things about a Disto 47. It is so wonderful here in Georgia, it's so resistant to disease. It does excellent. Um, and with the Disto 47, I harvest at full slip, which means basically I'm walking down the aisle, I smell cantaloupe, I look down and I see the cantaloupe, I grab the cantaloupe, if it comes right off the vine, then it has been just harvested at full slip. Like it just comes off, is at full slip. At half slip would be like needing to give it a bit of a tug. Okay, problems with melons. Um, there are some problems, but we have remedies available. Um, Cucumber beetles can be an issue um, on melons. I don't think they've ever really, you know, just, well, okay. No, nope, I'm not gonna say that. I'm having a growing season right in front of me. Never say never. Um, if you can do the amaranthus to trap crop the cucumber beetles away from your melons, that would be awesome. Um, pickle worms were an issue for me with cantaloupe last year and I'm not sure. Yes, there it is. Uh, so with um, cantaloupe, this is evidence of uh, pickle worm. Basically the worm, um, the egg hatch to bore into the cantaloupe and that is frass. That black is frass, which is basically caterpillar poop. Um, so the first sign of this, you would want to go back to your BT or spinosa to prevent further damage. Um, I don't think I put a slide in here, but I want to mention with watermelons, um, the growing practices are very, very similar to the cantaloupes. Um, if you want to grow seed, you know, varieties with seed like Georgia rattlesnake, they are very easy. Um, the one thing that takes a little bit of getting used to is knowing when to harvest. And I do not believe that you can tap a watermelon to know when it's ready. I do not believe you can look on the underside to know when it's ready. There's all these different suggestions that people give, um, but the only one that has held true for me, and I'm so sorry I didn't put a picture up, is when is looking at the color of the leaves closest to the stem of the watermelon. and you know what, I'm gonna make sure that this is included in the follow-up resources because if somebody had told me this four years ago, my life would have been a lot easier. Um, but it, there's a specific point you look at where the watermelon is attached to the vine, the color of the leaves at that junction, when they start to not look green anymore, when they start to look brown, the watermelon is ready for picking because the watermelon will not slip off the vine, you have to cut it off. Okay, so that is all I have for you today. Um, I think Laura is going to um, 
read some of your all's questions. Um, we'll do as best we can to get to as many as possible. Thanks, Rachel. That was great and good timing. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I've been taking note. I think a few of them got answered as you went on. Uh, a couple of these that I noticed and feel free to just reiterate or poke me in the chat box if I don't get to yours. Um, one of them we had earlier on and you sort of alluded to it with the seedless mm -hmm. watermelon and maybe some plants are more finicky than others. Mm -hmm. Is there a necessity or a, a benefit to checking soil temperatures before you decide to sow seed? Ah, um, you know, at, at the beginner stage, I think it'd be kind of fun. Um, you could mm -hmm. get a, a temperature monitor. Mm -hmm. um, I think they sell those, you know, in stores or um, maybe better than that is looking up on the Georgia um, Laura, what is that called? The Weather Network associated with UGA? Oh I can never think of the full name. Yes. We'll, we'll link the it in the email. <laughs> network. Yes. Yeah, there's a there's a weather network associated with UGA that gives the coolest data um, if you're a data dork like me. And you can actually find out what is the soil temperature at two inches deep, at four inches deep, at six inches deep in your area. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. And, and that April 15th date which is really funny i mean this is april 15th yes we didn't plan that but go out and plant you know now is safe um but that georgia i mean that april 15th date is really kind of it uses that historical data the same data that uh rachel's talking about that they collect um so you don't really have to for most of your plants if you're doing it with you know according to the seed packet and in your last frost date and things like that um most of the time that should be enough. I, I agree with Rachel. It's always kind of good to know and get the hang of what your temperatures are, are at and, and if you're accurate in your, in your assumptions. Um, really quickly, uh, since a few people may be hanging around longer than others, I do want to reiterate, and this was another question, there's going to be a follow-up email to this class and that'll include some resources that Rachel feels are helpful, some of the stuff based on your questions that we may decide to include some publications. Some of the slides. If you did not register on the ACC website, we won't have your email. So just shoot an email to that uh, address up the, there on the screen, Joanna.Wright, and that's my program assistant, and she'll make sure that you get all the same stuff that the people that registered um, get. So I just wanted to plug that real fast in case some of you sign off before we catch you. Sorry, Rachel. And then so uh, another good question was about rotating and if you have a small area, either just one or two raised beds, or maybe you're just doing some container gardening, mm -hmm. are there any kind of tricks or what would you suggest for people in terms of rotating those families around if you have really limited soil? Right, right. So with container gard, if you're doing container gardening, you don't need to worry about rotating. Um, you're I, I would assume if you're dumping out the soil and using new soil every year, it doesn't matter if you use the same container, um, would help to maybe wash it with an SOS pad or, you know, just, just get it, get it washed before you use it. Um, if you have a small area, this is a common issue is most small gardens really don't have enough room to do a perfect crop rotation. Honestly, some farms don't either. It's a constant struggle. I would say just do the best you can. If you have just two raised beds, just don't do tomatoes, you know, in consecutive years. You know, move them to the other bed the next year. Um, the other thing that can help is all of those um, cultural suggestions that I put in on the slide about, um, you know, just to keep diseases away, um, the point about removing the debris. So um, if you have a small space, be really diligent about getting the diseased plants. Like once your plant dies, getting it out, um, or if it gets sick, um, if a yucky leaf falls on the soil, try to get it out. Um, because if you get that material out, then you're getting like the, um, the germs out basically. So that's, that's what I'd suggest. Just do the best you can. Okay. Um, we had a question about when you were in the tomato section, if you would recommend single stemming tomatoes. 
I don't, I do not do that. Um, if you have time, um, by all means, um, I am so into experimenting. Um, and I've learned things by experimenting, um, in my own garden. So try and experiment and see, um, I, I, I really, I just don't know because I've never done it before. Um, but I'm sorry, I just, that question made me think of something that I didn't say with the peppers that I do want to mention um, because it was an experiment that I did in my garden and worked. Um, when you plant your uh, peppers, make sure to remove any flowers that are on the peppers at the time you plant. Um, even if they're not open, if they're just little unopened balls, if you just, you know, clip them off with a little pair of scissors, um, because what I've found is there is a huge difference in how well the plants will grow um, when you plant a transplant, a tomato or a pepper with flowers on it versus taking the flowers off. Because when you take the flowers off, the plant spends its energy making a good root system, making a good plant so you can have an awesome crop instead of getting that tiny little two inch pepper, you know, six weeks from now. <laughs> um, we have uh, at least one more question. I'm sure we might have a couple more coming in. And I also want to mention, I'm just going to keep asking y'all if, if you do, as you uh, sign off and when we finish up with our questions, um, please do take a minute if you can, just to maybe after you need your, some blood sugar, after you eat dinner or whatever, as long as you don't forget. And um, click on that link in your email and just take a moment to fill out that eval. Again, just want to plug that. And we did get another question. Um, uh, if somebody is creating a new raised bed, do they need to put holes in the bottom for drainage? And if so, how many? Um, uh, the bed's going to be about four by four and two feet deep. Is also, is that big enough to do some of those like tomato, bean, peppers, like a four by four, two foot deep? Um, I mean, whatever you have is, is going to work. That's what I would say. Um, I'm not sure when you say holes in the raised bed, it would like, so there's a, there's actually a bottom on this. Um, cause what I would do is put wherever I want my raised beds on a, an area with dirt or earth. I wouldn't put it on a cement slab. If I, if I, if I had the choice, I would put it on top of grass and I would put cardboard down over the grass, um, completely covering all the grass and weeds, and then put your soil compost or whatever inside Inside after that. Um, if you have a bottom on this raised bed, um, then yes, definitely put a ton of holes in it. Absolutely, any anything with a bottom must have holes uh, when it comes to growing plants. Yeah, in terms of the, is it big enough? I think a four by four by two foot raised bed would be big enough for any of the things that you mentioned and some combination of them. Mm -hmm. As long as you're following some of the spacing recommendations, either that Rachel mentioned or specific to the plants that you get they should have spacing recommendations on there if you need to ask you can always uh, email me and, and ask a specific one you just don't want to get them too crowded in there because then you're going to end up with competition but more importantly likely some disease issues that you don't want so so i i do think you can fit a few of those in there just kind of have to yeah, Laura has a really good point about not getting greedy in those raised beds because it's really easy when the soil's all bare to think, well, I can go eight inches and not 12 inches. I, I will literally take a, a measuring tape out there and make sure that I'm doing the right spacing, um, but it'll help you in the long run. Um, we have a question, and this is a, this is a great question. It's also could probably, we'll do a, should do a whole class on it one of these days, but any <laughs> recommendations for beneficial or predatory insects instead of sprays? Right. Um, so ladybugs are a great um, beneficial. Uh, lace wings are a great beneficial. Praying mantis. Um, spiders. Um, so attracting beneficial insects I mean, you couldn't go online and buy them, um, but 
the easier thing to do, the better thing to do, in my opinion, is to plant plants that beneficial insects like. Um, and that's one thing that I've really worked on hard this year on my farm. I have a lot of stuff growing that is there just because I know that insects, good insects like it. Um, I don't know of any beneficial insect um, that will kill hornworms and fruit worms, you know, the, the guys that get on your tomatoes. Actually, there's um, um, a number of parasitoid wasps. That oh, are there? Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Can you buy them? I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can or not. It's another one of those things where if you have a kind of varied um, landscape and then they are attracted right. in similar ways as other beneficials in doing careful spraying, um, like we mentioned, not just bees, but if you're spraying during the day and not being careful and spraying when you don't have to or using something that can kill all of the insects, then that's mm -hmm. going to kind of knock out some of your beneficial systems. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I've certainly seen that in my own yard, the little eggs growing out of the hornworms and things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I don't, you know, I've ordered uh, ladybugs many times or just bought them at the garden store. Um, it's just for some of the, I mean, you're right, a varied landscape and not having just a lawn and then a, you know, garden, um, you're going to have better, better helpers around. Um, for plant spacing, is the spacing the same at the end of the row? Um, presumably in plant has extra room. So I think, ah. I think what they're asking is, can you get away with closer <laughs> spacing at the end? Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you've already planted it, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, I mean, generally, the more spacing, the better. But, you know, this gardening, you learn as you go. And what better way to learn than by doing it? So, I mean, I, I, I would not stick an extra plant in, but I do know what you mean about utilizing that end space in a raised bed. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses. Oh, if you meant for the raised bed, I didn't even totally, if you are speaking about raised bed, one thing is, and, and Rachel talked about this, there's certain plant, plants will trail, usually like the cucurbits and melons or potentially even your cucumbers if you want to train them. You could almost plant them in the corners or towards the end and train them away from the other plants or have them drape out of the raised bed if they're melons. And that way, you know, you couldn't normally grow a melon plant in a raised bed, take up your entire raised bed. But if you wanted to plant that melon towards the corner and give it some space, but then have it kind of spill out of the raised bed, that's one way of taking advantage of that. Did I miss anyone? Does anybody, did I miss somebody's question during the presentation? Or does anybody have any other questions? we got a few more minutes. I'll close it down right at 7.30. And then if we don't get to you for, um, for some reason, or if you come up with a question later, again, that, that email address for the Extension Office, or if you want to just Google the athens Clark County or your own county Extension Office, you can always contact your Extension Office and ask all these questions. We'd be happy to help you. Yeah, wasps, um, yep, uh, Mel was saying um, she gets parasitic wasps in her, some of her figs. Yeah, some of those wasps that pollinate the figs, I think you might be right. There's a number of different parasitic wasps out there. You'd be surprised. There's also a lot of wasps or hornet in the hornet family, even though they're not parasitic, are predatory. So yellow jackets and things. I've watched yellow jackets eat uh, caterpillars off the grass. That's a really good point. Wasps, I have a lot of wasps on my property and it's kind of, I feel bad when people come over and, and yeah, come my husband hates them, but I don't, I mean, they're not, as long as they're not stinging you. Exactly. They, yes. They, yes. And they tend to eat a lot of critters. So, or parasitize them. So. Can't they also pollinate? Yeah. Most, most things can pollinate. I think it depends a lot on the type of wasp or hornet, whether or not they, some of them visit flowers and some of them. Right, right, flowers. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, not, not entirely. So I had a question about fruit tree varieties in Athens. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, there's a, there's a lot. So I may, that may be something, Michael, if you want to, I'll just put my email in here again, so you don't have to look it up. If you want to email me that, that might be something that's even easier to send you some, some resources so that you don't forget, you don't have to write it all down really quick. Speaking of fruit tree varieties, same with, like we get to have this discussion with vegetables as well. There's some fruit trees in general not just varieties, but types of fruit that are going to do much better, or at least be mm -hmm. a lot easier to grow and harvest fruit from in Athens than others. And that's going to be your figs. Somebody yes. think might have been you. Figs are pretty good, easy uh, fruit as in terms of fruit goes um, to grow in this region. Mm -hmm. um, uh, blanking. Pomegranate. Blueberries. You, uh, blueberries are, you know, native high bush blueberries do well here. Uh, your bramble, I know those aren't trees, um, brambles like blackberries um, do pretty well here, but there are recommended varieties of apples and pears and things like that that can be really tricky in this area. We are in the Piedmont, but they still get um, rusts and uh, rot, brown rot, um, so brown rot is going to be your peaches and, and, and all of your peach family stuff, but there are apple pear varieties specifically that um, are resistant to fire blight and some of the things that get those fruit trees uh, pretty nasty here. So um, what about lemon trees? Well, lemon tree, you could do a lemon tree, but you'd have to grow it in a pot, like a Meyer lemon, and then bring it. That are hardy to our... our there, what about Satsuma? That's being grown in Georgia. I'm not. I'm just not sure if it'll survive the winters here or not. Right. I, I can look into that. But um, right. but yeah, in terms of those varieties, if you want to shoot me an email and remind me, I can send you some great um, resources on those fruit tree varieties. And Dixie, same for you. If you want to shoot me an email, any of y'all, if you want to shoot me an email about the lemon trees, I'll look and see if there are any varieties that could potentially manage um being outside here i i mean if you're at all a fan of blueberries the rabbit eye blueberries and I meant rabbit eyes, I yeah the rabbit eyes are just i mean you okay. stick it in and go <laughs> i mean you don't even they want acidity you don't even have to lime i mean yeah just yeah so pomegranates low. are possible here um some more and more kind of small growers have been planting pomegranates in this area papa are great i've actually been wanting to get some papa um, sometimes it's hard to get the fruit from them because the wildlife tend to get them first and they, they don't even need full sun, which a lot, all those other fruit trees are going to need. A note on the pomegranate though, you do not want to use wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful pomegranate is not very well adapted here, but there's a two recommended by UGA. One of it is Nikitsi something, do you, do you know this? Um, Again, yeah, I can, I can definitely find her. Almost any tree or fruit or even vegetable that's grown here, there's been trialed research on, on the recommended ones for the, the different areas of Georgia. So um, yeah, if you have a variety question, that'd be easier for me to send that stuff to you um, mm -hmm. in text. Um, so we have a tomato question. We have a couple more minutes here. So regarding picking tomatoes at first blush, yes. Um, when we've tried this, the fruit has been mealy or developed uh, rot mm -hmm. spots before fully ripening. Have you experienced this or know how to address this? Uh, no, but I wonder um, was right. that mealy often ha mealy fruit. Some, I mean, in my experience, has happened when the weather's cooler. When you're growing tomatoes like in a cooler environment. Um, I I have not experienced this. Laura, do you have any comments? My first on this? thought would be it could be that some varieties um, ripen better off, you know, like with ah, yes. spread widely for different types of harvesting and shelf life. So it could just be that some of them don't. And you mentioned, um, Rachel, that you do a lot of hybrids, which probably right. find the be picked, um, not necessarily completely ripe. So um, do you know, do you know what variety that you all were growing at that point? In terms of putting tomatoes in a paper bag, um, yeah, all of the, and I'm losing my vocabulary, all of these fruits and vegetables that ripen after being picked have a certain term, but they fall into a certain category and they all produce ethylene as a byproduct of their ripening. 
and that ethylene is kind of cyclical, it also helps them ripen faster. So that's the idea of putting different fruits and vegetables in a paper bag, is that it kind of increases the concentration of the ethylene and they'll help them ripen faster. It won't change the characteristics, it just kind of speeds up that process. Mm -hmm and tomatoes next apples. So both of them produce a lot of ethylene. Those are high ethylene producers. And so they'll, they'll ripen each other. Yeah, um, I, I have a suspicion, I can't be 100% sure, but they mentioned that the, for with the tomato question that it was an heirloom tomato. My guess is that yeah. a lot of heirlooms are not as, uh, they're just not really technically designed, I guess, is the best word. But, I see. That's interesting. I feel uh, bad for putting that slide yeah, there. Okay, that I'm sure some heirlooms are fine, too. I yeah. think it's just the genetic variability, but some of the heirlooms just may not have that characteristic because a lot of breeding has gone into being able to pick uh, mm -hmm. tomatoes when they're less sensitive, you know, and don't go back right. the way. Great question. Thanks for That's, bringing that up. Okay, any ideas regarding rodents and deer? Oh. We <laughs> may have a, a nuisance. I may do a nuisance wildlife talk one of these days. I think people would love that. Um, Those are both very tricky. I do. Uh, the, the, just uh, one thing. I, I, if you do not have chickens or other livestock, um, one thing we've done because we have uh, mice um, and bunnies is we've put in a hawk perch uh, mm. because I've actually gotten bunny kills. I mean, I don't see yeah. the, you know, but I'll see feathers and stuff. So if you don't have something that a hawk could, you know, take, <laughs> a hawk perch might help. Uh, for the deer, I'm, I'm always going to recommend fencing. It's either electric or, or, you know, the typical fun thing. Yeah, if you can cage, you know, your individual, if you have a raised bed or container, I think Bill mentioned, they do work. They're not always practical if you have a big area or, and then they may not look great, but if you're really having issues, uh, physical exclusion is yes. not always the easiest, but usually the most effective. Yes. Um, well, it is 7.32, so I'm going to let uh, Rachel go. Again, like I said, if, if you come up with any more questions or you have anything else, feel free to contact myself or your own extension office if you're not in Clark County. Um, we're going to have more of these classes month by month. Keep in touch on our website or one of our social media pages. Sign up for the newsletter if you're not already on there. It's got some great uh, timely articles in it as well. Um, and also, I'm going to be starting potentially forever, but at least during um, our social distancing times. Every Wednesday, I'm going to do an Ask Your Agent hour, and so it's going to work kind of like this, but it's just going to be open, drop-in, kind of office hour. And so if you have questions, I'll just be on the screen, hopefully with my camera, and you don't even have to mute yourself, and you can just pop in and have a discussion with me about what's going on. Um, so look out for that on all those same resources. I think it's already up on our Facebook page, but it'll just be a, a Zoom link for that. So that's another way of kind of, if you have a few more questions. All right, everybody, have a great evening. Um, so glad you could join us, and hopefully we'll see you all at our composting class next month. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye, have Rachel. fun gardening.